Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to an exciting Chabura Shiur. We have with, with us our beloved Chacham Berdugo, who's uh, with us very often, thank God. Uh, we're going to be discussing today uh, the Omer and Rabbi Akiva, all the different minhagim that people have during this time, what exactly happened, uh, very apropos. Um, so we are going to start with that, uh, just uh, announcing that uh, we the Chabura published our Shavuot book, so make sure to get a copy uh, before uh, the, the Moed. Uh, speaking of books, uh, Chacham Berdugo also has a book that was published with us a while ago, Understanding Chazal, so make sure you get a copy of that as well. Uh, we always love to see your faces, so if possible, uh, you know, open your uh, cameras. Um, and with that, uh, the floor is yours, Chacham. All righty, thank you so much again. It's a zikhut to be here with you guys, as always. As Israel is in war right now, there should be a zikhut for all the soldiers and all the citizens to protect them. So although this topic may be a day or two days old, or I would say delayed, because if you're, let's say, most Sephardim, they already started taking a haircut or shaving today. Many Ashkenazi men, also Sephardim, already did it on Lagba Omer. Uh, nevertheless, we'll see from the Geonim, we'll see from different shitot that uh, could be the original minhag was to go all the way to Shavuot, and that's what the Mikubalim actually do. The Mikubalim are following the shitat Geonim in this case. So what we'll do is we're going to start from the beginning of the Gemara, from the Gemara of Yivamot, which talks about the incident that happened with the Talmudim of Rabbi Akiva, which I'm sure everybody knows. And from that, we'll see the developments throughout the times of, of uh, the different customs, like uh, Ohan mentioned, that developed from this, uh, either from this Gemara, or could be, historically, it came about due to other things, which we'll see what other post schemes said. So to begin, I'm going to share my screen with you all. And hopefully you guys can see it okay. So I actually, a couple of weeks ago, I, I started working on a little uh, response to Teshuvah, just going through the history about this and different shito, different opinions. So Sina asked me to speak on Monday. So I said, okay, yeah, I have a good topic because I just worked on it. So I just, just for the shiur, uh, an hour ago, two hours ago, I just kind of cut and paste from something I wrote and try to organize it in more of like a, an easier digestible format for us. So starting from the beginning, the Gemara Nyevamot, Daf Samich Bet, Amud Bet, it says, Amru Shnaim Asar Elef Zugim Talmidim Hayulol Rabbi Akiva. So Rabbi Akiva had 12,000 pairs of students, right? 24,000 Talmidim. They all died in one time frame. Why? Because they all died in one time frame. As everybody knows, because they weren't respecting, honoring each other, whatever that means. And we don't have to go through this, but until Rabbi Akiva found students in the south, and he transmitted the Torah to them, and therefore, Baruch Hashem, we continue to have the Torah. And then the end of that Gemara, it says... It says, So they all died. What was the exact time frame that they died? It was from Mipesach, from Pesach, all the way into Atzeret. Atzeret is another name for Shavuot. And So look at who said it. They died a horrific death. Mahi, what type of horrific death was this? Amar Nahman. Askara, it was Askara, something called Askara. So we're going to see what that means. Simply, Askara is some type of disease. I don't know how you translate it in English. I'm not sure how art school translates, but some type of disease that they, that a plague that killed them. So, based off this Gemara, we find, I would say, the tour who codifies it in a book that, you know, is a national book that everybody uses, the Beit Yosef, Shukhan has written on based off the tour. And the tour he writes, so there's a custom that developed. The custom is, is that, and he says, everywhere, universally, no matter where you are, is that you don't get married from the time of Pesach until Shavuot. What's the reason? 
שלא להרבות בשמחה שבאותו זמן מתו תלמידי רבי עקיבא. We don't want to increase our happiness, have too much happiness, because during that time, the students of רבי עקיבא passed away. And he says, the Rigiat, the Rigiat was Rabbi Tzach Giat. He says, Dafka Nisuin Shu Ikar Simcha. The Rigiat was from, I think, correctly, correct me if I'm wrong, Elusena in Spain, the early Rishonim. And he writes there that it was specifically only marriage, because that's the main Simcha of marriage, of, of, of you know, having a husband and wife getting together is the marriage. But if you're just going to do Le'ares, Le Kadesh, just the engagement process, that would be okay, not a problem. And then he writes that, of course, if, if uh, somebody transgresses this minhag, we don't punish them. Okay, and then he continues to say, And now he brings in the yesh mekomot. You have to medayek in his words. In some places, because before he said, for marriage. However, some places have a custom not to get a haircut. And then, but... The, in these people, or in, in, it sounds like another minhag, so you have a minhag within another minhag, so some people don't get haircuts the entire time, and some, they actually get a haircut on Lagba Omer, yesterday, ve'elech, and continues until, until Shavuot, and they, she'omrim she'az p'skuli marot, because at that time, that's when the Talmudim of Rabbi Akiva, they stop dying, All right? How do we know this? There's no real clear source for how, how, where we know that it stopped at Lagba Omer. I mean, the Gemara said, Aratzeret, right? The entire time. So he's coming, throwing the wrench at us, saying, whoa, a curveball. Where it stopped at uh, Lagba Omer, based off what these people are saying. Fine. Then he brings out another custom, custom we're not going to get too much into, but there's another min minhag. I don't know anybody who practices min in this minhag nowadays. But from, from Pesach until Aratzeret, from Shkiyat Hama, once the sun goes down, until Shaharit, they don't do any melacha because of that was a time when they were busy burying all the Talmudim of Rabbi Akiva and therefore they were batel from melacha. And that's why people don't do it as well. They don't do melacha during that time. Um, yeah, and he brings down that uh, it was a gezer dafka for women. Interesting. Nagul hanashim shelo lasut melacha mishtika hama. So women, that was a minhag specific for women not to do melacha during that time. So you see, Three basic minhagim that the Torah is telling us that come source from this Gemara Nivamot is number one, not to, to get married. Number two, not to get haircuts. And number three, not to do melacha during Shikia until a Tzitikavim or until the morning. Sorry. So the question that, you know, everybody asks, and I'm sure many people in the Habura find the, these minhagim very difficult is that we do not find this anywhere, this, these customs in the Talmud. We don't find it in the Mishnah, not in the Talmud. We don't find it in any Midrashim, right? And, and not only that, we don't find it in the Rif, who was the, the greatest codifier, or the Rambam, also the greatest codifier, or even in the Rosh, who was one of the greatest Ashkenazi poskim as well. So what happened here? Where, how did this Minhag develop if we don't find it anywhere in Shas and in the, the works of the Hazal? And, uh, and and especially if it's based off the Gemara, you would think uh, it, it should be written somewhere in these works. So, however, we saw that the, the, the tour mentioned that it's from the Geonim. Right? He, did, I, did I bring it there? No, no. Oh, yeah. He says, Ukeze horu a Geonim. Right? The, the tour brought it in the name of the Geonim. So we need to see who are the Geonim. You know, academically, there's a, I forgot which professor I read, but he was saying that many times when Ashkenazim bring Geonim, it doesn't mean the Geonim from Bavel and the Geonim that we think when we say Geonim could be it's just great Ashkenazi Rabbanim. So first we have to see who are these Geonim that the tour is bringing down. So if you look at Rabbeinu Yerucham, he actually writes this, he brings this Minhag and he brings it in the name of Rav Hai Gaon. So that's an early Gaon or relatively early going. And, and therefore, seemingly, it's a, it's a beautiful source he has. And, and they asked him, they asked Rabbi Haigaon, and Rabbi, Rabbi Yerucham is quoting it, he's saying, they asked him, what's this, the source for the Minhag that we don't do Kiddushin, from uh, we don't get married, 
from uh, from Pesach and Terat Seret? Is it is Isur? Is it a mamash like an Isur that Hami made, or is it just like a Minhag? And he says it's not a, it's not because of Isur, rather it's just Minhag Avelut because of what happened with the Talmudim of Rabbi Akiva. He says Shnayim Asar Alpaim Alavim Zugim Talmudim Hayu Rabbi Akiva. The whole Gemara in Yevamot. He quotes the Gemara in Yevamot because they didn't give kavod to each other, and they all died because of Askara. And therefore, this is this is very important words from Rav. Rav Hai Gaon, he's saying, So he's saying from that time and onwards, meaning from the time of the death of Rabbi Akiva students, they, they developed the minhag during that time, from that time, that people wouldn't get married. Okay. And therefore, he just talks about Kiddushin. It's not a, if they do Kiddushin, it's not a problem. It's just marriage was the, the problem, like the tour said. And then I found also in the, the Halachut Pesukot, there they bring down that it's not Rav Hai Gaon. This, they bring it in the name of Rav Natrunai Gaon, which is also a very early Gaon, which is also brought in the Sharia Teshuah as well. So we see that many Rabbanim are bringing this in the name of Gaonim. Gaonim that we call Gaonim from Babel, Pumpedita, Surya, etc., so a big, a big uh, difficulty, a, a side point with this whole Gemara and the whole Minhag is I'm sure many people heard about this, the Igeret Rav Shirira Gaon. Right? This, the Igeret Rav Shirira Gaon is a very fundamental, very important letter that Rav Shirira Gaon, he wrote to Rabbi Yaakov Ben Nisim in Tunisia. He wrote in, uh, I think the city was called uh, Kairwan, Karwan. I don't know how to pronounce it properly. But Rav Yaakov bin Nisim was asking the Gaon, like, please give me a rundown of the entire Torah Shebalape. And, you know, what happened? Did Rabbi Yudha Nasi write down the Mishnayot? Did it go all the way down to the Geonim, the Savoraim? What happened until up to you, Rav Shirir Gaon? So it was the first pretty much written work giving the historical context of Torah Shebaal Peh. And there in that Igeret, we find something that is very interesting that kind of changes the reading of how our Gemara in Yevamot reads about the Talmidim of Rabbi Akiva. So, so here's the Lashon. It says, Ve'aymid Rabbi Akiva Talmidim Harbe. So Rabbi Akiva he had many Talmidim. Before that, it talks about how Rabbi Akiva, you know, he died because he was learning Torah. And then he says, Rabbi Akiva left many Talmidim. So this is the, the, this one word has caused thousands and thousands of papers to be written on this uh, Rabbi Shirira Gaon, this Igeret. It says, There was a Shemada on the students of Rabbi Akiva. What's a Shemada? A Shemada I don't know the proper English uh, translation, but uh, perhaps, you know, a persecution. There was a shemada is a war, a mamash like a, uh, a fight to destroy them and persecute these people. The Talmudim of Rabbi Akiva. Uh, so therefore, the, then he writes down that then after that, they had to rely on the, on the Talmudim of Rabbi Akiva, the second students of Rabbi Akiva, and he goes through the whole thing as well. And he talks about the, the 12,000 students, they passed away. Right? They all died during this time until he has a little, little different girsa here as opposed to our Gemara and Yevamot as well, but we're not going to get into that. But you see that Rav Shirina Gaon is saying here that the Talmudim Rabbi Akiva died because of a Shmada, because of this persecution, this war against them. He doesn't also mention, very important, he doesn't mention because they didn't give kavol zelaze, and he doesn't mention has, askara, this disease, this plague. Right? Actually, <laughs> I, I wanted to check in this, how they, the, the art school came out with a new introduction to the Talmud, and in the back, they actually have the entire Igeret of Rav Shirira Gaon. And I wanted to see if they can concile, you know, what do they write on the notes, if they make some shalom between our Gemara and this, and uh, I found a mistake there. It looks like when they were caught, when they were pasting or the English of the Gemara and Yevamot, they actually write in the words of Ashirir Gaon. If you want to, I can send it to you after if you don't have it. And he, he writes there, they did not, in the translation, they did not accord proper respect to one and another. 
But Rav Shudah the Gaon didn't write that. I'm looking in the Hebrew here too. He didn't write that at all. So they made a mistake. I don't know. I, I heard maybe if you can, if you get a mistake in art school, you get some money from them. I'm not sure. But anyways, they write there that uh, they didn't give kavod. Rav Shudah the Gaon never wrote that they didn't give kavod to each other. And he writes the word shemada, which is mashma, which seems like it's because there was a war against them. So, okay. So how do we... How do we get, how do we deal with this? And how do people, how do different uh, Rabbanim deal with the with these questions? Okay, so. Right, and, and first of all, you, you can't, let me just see how, what I wrote here. Right, so so this is the classic answer. The, this is the answer of the Dorot Rishonim of Rav Yitzhak Isaac Levi, Halevi. And that they want, they want to say is that, let's read it inside, it's better. He says, Lo yuchal yot safek ki leshono she Rav Shirira, right? It, for sure, the lashon that Rav Shirira Gaon used, the hava shemada ala talmidim she Rav Yakiva, enu mi lashon haragil shayu alihim shemad, la'aviram al dat ve nehergu. Right, he's saying, we, we have to, as I say in Yiddish, touch it up. It's not, Rabbi, Rav Shirida Gaon is not using the word Shemada as we normally use it. Rather, when he said Shemada, right, it must be something else. Meaning, he, he says, because usually Shemada means we're going fighting there against, the, killing these, persecuting because of their religion and to kill them. He says, because the Gemara and Mifurashim, he says, we can't say that because the Gemara says straight up in Yevamot, the Gemara said it's because of Askara. So therefore, um, and we know Askara, he brings from another Gemara, Askara, we know it's a play. And he says, so therefore he answers, So it must be that the Lashon of Rabbi Shirida, how does he answer? It's the Lashon means, Shmada means like there was a death, a plague to them. There was a destruction to them, to the people, to the Talmudim of Rabbi Akiv. And he brings from the Lashon of Tilim also, Nishmedu Ba'in Do'ar. Right, that they were destroyed in Indoar in that place, or in Sefer Breshit when Yaakov Avinu was telling his children, Right, if you what you guys are doing, Shimon and Levi, you're gonna cause me to me and my house to be killed, destroyed. Right, so he says, you see, Shmada can be used not to mean war. And right, this is actually what the art scroll brings down on the bottom. That of course there's no kiluk between them. And Shmada, you know, he just used the lashon in a maybe poetic or different uh, love dafka way. However, I have a problem with this is because, you know, first of all, the words that the Dorot Harishonim, Rav Yitzhak Isaac Alevi is bringing, all these psukim, Nishvedu Be'in Do'ar, or uh, what Yaakov Avinu said, that the, the context there is mamash by sword. They would fight to Milhama and kill them in war. So we still see, from the proofs he was trying to bring, that Shmada means Lavdafka, you see from there specific, straight up that, no, Shmada, the word Shmada means through killing, through persecution, through, through, through war, not through some play. So therefore, how can you reconcile it and say, oh no, shmada means haskara. It's very hard to say that. So alternatively, I, I was thinking about this and I've seen other people who said that as well. Probably wasn't my own original idea. And we're going to see that other Rabbanim say it as well. Is that Rav Shirira Gaon, he probably was bringing the historical context of what was going on back then is we all know that Rabbi Akiva he held that Bar Kuziva, Bar Kozva, Bar Kiz, whatever you Bar, Bar Kuchba, however you want to call him, that he was the Mashiach, right? This is the you have the the Midrash and Ikaraba. It says Rabbi Akiva can have a hamile lehaden Bar Kuziva, have Amar Hainu Malka Mishiha. Right? Rabbi Akiva, the Midrash says, then Rabbi Akiva would look at when he would see Bar Kuziva, he would say, That's the Mashiach. What did Ben Kuziva do that he was so great? Right? He was like Superman. He could say somebody threw a bullet or threw something at him. Of course, they didn't have guns. Whatever, they threw a rock at him with some type of tool. And he would catch it with his body and throw it back at them and kill many people with the stone that they threw at him. So he was uh, much like a Superman. And on that, Rabbi Akiva said, yeah, you see, that's why he's the Mashiach, right? This is not the, the modern uh, 
you know, what they teach in Bet Sefer, who the Mashiach is going to be, not some super war hero. But the Rebbe Kiva is like, no, the reason why he's Mashiach is because he's a super war hero. <laughs> That's why. But uh, anyways, Rambam as well, he brings down in Hilchot, Melachim and Milchamot, I'm sure everybody knows this one, is that, you know, Rebbe Akiva, Ham Gadol, Mechokim Mishnah, he was one of the greatest Rabbanim. And the Huaya no Sekhelav Shad Ben Koziba Amelech. And he used to carry the, you know, the, the utensils, you know, he used to serve by, by Ben Koziba, who was like a Melech. At that time, he was a Mashiach. He thought he was a Mashiach. He thought that he was a Mashiach. And this is interesting, Rambam. Not only the Rabbi Akiva, but all the Hachamim of his time, of Rabbi Akiva's time, it was one of the greatest Rabbanim. So people follow, you know, if Haim Ganyafi says, everybody's going to follow. So they were following him as well. Everybody thought he was a Mashiach. So therefore, if that's the case, and we know that Bar Kuziba, he passed away in war. Uh, the Gemara has something that Hachamim killed him, but he, he, his soldiers, there was a massacre and all his soldiers died. So therefore, perhaps historically, what happened is that, you know, the Talmudim and Rabbi Akiva, they were following Rabbi Akiva and they went to war. They went and fought with to go with Bar Kuziba and fight the Romans, fight, fight the Goyim. And they died in war. And that's what happened. And that's a Shmada. The Shmada against the Talmudim and Rabbi Akiva is that they died in war. So that's a simple way to say that. However, it conflicts with our Gemara. And so seemingly, according to this, you have to say, you know, something, how do you, you know, our Gemara, we're going to see actually where Mazu says this is beautiful, but there is some contradiction. You know, either our Girsa is right and Rav Shira Gaon is wrong, or Rav Shira Gaon is right and our Girsa, Girsa is wrong. It was changed because of the censors or whatever. So I found in Or Torah, which was, is a beautiful uh, magazine, or I don't know how you call it, Kuntras that comes out from the yeshiva of Kisera Hamim in Ben Ebra, that the, the Rav Neiman, the mayor Mazuz, he should live and be well, he writes, he deals with this issue uh, very nicely. And he writes, he says, let's say it inside, let's read it inside. He says, He says, that the Gemara says in Yevamot because of Askara, that plague, he says, that if they were in reality to treat themselves, treat each other respectfully, they would have been saved in a miraculous way through the merit of the Torah. And due to that, perhaps Bar Kochba would have won the war because of how the Talmudim and treated each other so nicely, respectfully. So he's trying to say, let's continue. But he's saying, So this is interesting. So he, pretty much he's saying is that Hachamim, they gave one perspective of the story, but Rav Shiriragon was giving more of a historical and actual perspective of what happened. And that they're spiritually tied together, that you know that we could win the war if spiritually the Hachamim were nicer to each other. But it all ties down to the war of Bar Kuziva. And he says a very big yesod. He says that the Hachamim, they always wanted to hide certain attributes of the Jewish people that were warriors and that we know how to fight. And we know when we need to step up to the play, we can step up to it because of the different kingdoms we're living under. Because we, don't, we didn't have our own state. We didn't have our own country, etc. We're living under Goyim. So the Hachamim kind of have to hide it and kind of focus on the more spiritual aspect of things as opposed to the more materialistic war-like uh, um, perspective so he says and he said he brings like in shabbat for example the gemara in shabbat it, it talks about my hanukkah and he says because of the the nes pach shemen and it didn't talk about the whole thing of the or it did talk about but very lightly he says right all it said it pretty much it all I mentioned about the war, which was the, the probably the biggest miracle that we took on, the Hashmonaim took on, the Yibanim, right? It just says one word, Venit's home. That's it. You know, very simple. One word. It was very katsur on, on, the, on, the, on that thing, on that matter. And it just moved and talked about the spiritual thing of the, of the fire, the miraculous uh, uh, aspect of that miracle. And so you see that, again, they didn't focus on that. Although the, the difficulty is that in our Amidah, it only focuses on that. Fine, but whatever. Vigam Rabinu Akadosh in the Mishnah. Rabinu Akadosh, also, he doesn't talk about the Nes Hanukkah. 
right? All, only in Baba Kama, he mentions it in a very agav way, in a not so direct way, just talking about the, you know, if there's a Hanukkah outside, whatever. So he says, and, and, and he brings from the pre Hadash, the, the first, the real reason, you know, there's always all these questions why do we have eight nights of Hanukkah? Why do we light eight nights? Whatever. So the pre Hadash answers the first night we're lighting is because of the, this war that we won against the, the, the Yavanim. So he's saying this, this Yesod of Hahamim is to kind of hide and not dwell on the fact that, you know, the Jewish, Jewish people are awesome soldiers and can kick, you know, uh, their tochis. <laughs> I don't know if I was okay. And the Kushyotanas So he's saying now this answers all the questions about you know was it only the Talmudim at Rabbi Akiva? Why do we have all these minhagim? Where did it come from? Say no, Hahamim, they were hiding it. And not only are we mourning the Talmudim of Rabbi Akiva, but we're mourning for Klal Yisrael that they were really decimated, they were really destroyed during this war with Bar Koziva against the Romans. And that's why we have all of these, all of these uh, minhagim of, of the Omer, because he says, Ki hem churban betar yisr karov yehudim rabim. It says, because during that time, that's when Betar was destroyed and around 1 million Jews died. So now Rabbi Mazuz, through this, is giving us, you know, a, a, a stronger reason. It's not only because of the Talmudim, but it was because of war that we lost. And it's mentioning just Rabbi Akiva and his Talmudim, again, only because Bahamim were focusing on more of the spiritual reasons behind the, the loss or the, the reason why we didn't have the merit to win the war. But of course, there's no stira, there's no contradiction between what Rabbi, uh, what our Gemara, Gemara and Yevamot says, and what Rabbi Shri Ragaon was talking about. Um, fine. And then also, so according to Rabbi Mazuz, you have to say that there was really no Askara, which is a little difficult. The, the Gemara said there's Askara, that there was this plague. Uh, but according to Rabbi Mazuz, saying no, Hahamim just used the word Askara to hide it from the Goyim. There was really no plague, but they just wanted to focus on Rabbi Akiva and his Talmudim. And there was no really askara. So very interesting. Another, I found another rabbi, Ner La Ezra. He's a rab, rab Shmuel David. He's a rabbi somewhere north, I think, a chief rabbi in one city in Israel. And he wanted to say that that askara really means shemad, shemada. You could actually, you know, somehow he wants to say it's the same thing. Then that, and that, you know, just because we're used to the art school word, askara means plague, and how people translate it, that's not true. But the the question on that. Is that you know I brought in a few places here in Berachot and Sota and uh, that clearly you see Askara throughout Shas is actually talking about a plague, a disease, a sickness. So we can't give that answer. So just to move on, after thinking about all these answers and how to kind of you know make shalom between them, <laughs> I was looking more into the the background of the Igeret of Rav Shirira Gaon, and the truth is is that. There's two different versions of Rav Shirira Gaon, of the Egeret Rav Shirira Gaon. You have the, the, the most common one in the, the traditional one of religious people they use is the, the Nusach Sfaradi, the, the Sephardic version of it. But however, there's also a Nusach Safati, a French version. And that really, I think it became a little more known later on, recent, more recent. And the the professors and all the doctrines, etc., the doctors, they, they believe that the, the Nusach Sarfati, the French version, is more accurate. And if you look, I looked in the French version, and believe it or not, it doesn't have the word, it skips out the whole word of Shmada. It doesn't have the word in there. So, uh, where did I write it? Yeah, he says, look, that's it. The delay, it skipped the whole part. It doesn't have that in the French version. So, you know, to make it simple, we could just say, okay, the French version is more authentic, although it does go against the classic tradition that many people have. I think, for example, Rav Yisrael uh, Moshe Hazan, he brings down that the Spanish version is the more authentic one, not the French version. But then I saw also that maybe people don't even know, maybe we call the Spanish version the, the French version and really the French version is the Spanish version. Uh, so it's not so clear. But anyways, to make Shalom al-Yisrael, 
you know, you just say that uh, it didn't have the word Shemada and somehow some, some uh, mistake fell into the Girsa. And the, the, the reason why I'm, I'm, I'm pro this and kind of going with the French version is because we brought above in the, uh, in the name of, of Rav Haid Gaon, right? Rabbeinu Yeruham brought the minhag of not getting married during the minhag. The Omer was from who? Rav Haid Gaon. And who's Rav Haid Gaon? The son of Rav Shirira Gaon. <laughs> and in that teshuvah of the Gaonim above that Rabbeinu Yeruham brought, straight up there, it says, Mishum shelo nahagu kabot zeleze, and they died because of Askara. So we're going to have a problem if we're going to say, oh, Rav Shirira Gaon said this, but his son holds something else. His son holds like our girsa in the Gemara Yabamot. Although it could happen, it's just not so plausible. And we try to probably, mistama, seemingly, we should limit that. And then I found also, there's another a set of tishuvot of Hachmei Ashkenazus Farfat, of, of, of the of different tishuvot of Geonim as well. And there they actually bring in the name of Rav Sherida Gaon that uh, the Hachamim Gazru, not to have the Simcha during uh, this, this, this time, during the Omer, because of what happened to Rabbi Akiva. Um, and therefore you see that, uh, let me see, right, I mean, there, you could still say that's not a, a question because even according to Rav Shirir Gaon, there was a disaster that happened. There was a Shemada and therefore you can still have these Minhagim that we have nowadays. So it, it really, it's a side point. I may have to redo what I just wrote as I'm thinking with you guys now, but nevertheless, you see from the son of Rav Shirir Gaon, Rav, Rav Hai Gaon, that he had the girsa that we have in our Gemara, and on top of it, we have the Nusach of the, of the Sarfati, the Ashkenazi version of the, the Shiriraga own uh, text, and therefore, could be there's not a problem. So anyways, stage two. I, I'm only really going on this because a lot of people I see, see from many Rabbanim is that they dismiss the, the our Gemara, and they dismiss all the Minhagim of the Omer because they say, oh, anyways, our Gemara is wrong, and it's uh, completely false. And uh, it was all about the war and about Kochba. And therefore, you know, we don't have to follow these bin Hakim. The truth is, it's not so Pashut because we have from Geonim, we have from, you know, early Geonim quoting the Girsa that we have. And on top of it, I actually checked, you know, online, I could see all the different, whatever Girsa we have of the text available and all of them and our Gemara, every Gemara that they have available right now of any Kitve Yad has Askara inside of that text. And it doesn't have anything about Shmada. The only Mekor that I could find is Rav, from this Rav Shirir Agaon. That doesn't mean it's right. I mean, what I'm saying is right, but it's just less probable. Anyways, so we have this Minhag. We have to go back to the question about the Minhagim. Why don't we find it in the Rambam? We don't find it in the Rip. We don't find it in the Rosh. But at the same time, so, so maybe we would think that this is a later development. But we found that at the same time, we find that it's already brought down from the Geonim, early Geonim. So... Who's one of the earlier Geonim that we see bringing it down? Because you could still say, you know, let's say, you know, there's a concept in Hazal, if you want to, I forgot the exact uh, English word for it, but sometimes you want to make people really care about what you have to say. So they would actually say in the name of somebody else what they're really saying, even though that other person never said it. You know, they want to say, oh, you know, I, uh, the Rambam said this, even though the Rambam never said that. So perhaps maybe these, you know, all these people that are bringing Rabbeinu Yerucham, all the other, the early Ashkenazi Rabbanin, that they're bringing this minhag, maybe they're saying it, and Rav Natranai Gaon, or Rav Shikira Gaon, they're just, you know, using that to boost their credibility, but not really that these Geonim actually said it. And it's something that, you know, now in modern scholarship, we don't like that, but that's something that the Chachamim, the Gemara Hagiga, allows to do. <laughs> so maybe that's the, that's the case. However, we can't say that because I found in Rav Yitzhak Yat, he was, Rav Yitzhak Yat was from Lucina, Spain, which the tour brought him above. And he was, I think, in the, the, the year 1000, around that time. And he did a big work service for Am Yisrael. He was collecting the works of the Geonim, right? He, besides the fact that he was in correspondence with the Geonim during his time, he collected the works of the Geonim. And he brings down this minhag. So it's way before, even before, you know, uh, we're going to see what other rabbis say, but this is an early mekor. So he says, and he says, Minhag He brings down the Minhag is not to get married in between this time. So therefore, you see that this Minhag sounds like, you know, he's living in Spain, in Lucina, Spain. So that this Minhag probably was accepted in practice in Sfarad, in Spain. Um, 
I just brought in here that the Chida brings down from certain rabbis that even Sfaradi rabbis are saying that there's no mikor for these minhagim of not getting married and the Chida argues on them. And you see for sure, many of these rabbis, they didn't see from Yitzhak Ibn uh, Evan Giat, the, the, the Ritzi Giat, he, they didn't see that he brought it because it's a, it's for sure from the Geonim. It's not something brought from the Rishonim, made up from the Rishonim. So nevertheless, the only minhag we find from the Geonim is not to get married. We don't find any minhag about not listening to music and even more so not listening to or not getting a haircut. We do not find this custom brought anywhere in the early Geonim. However, so I found in the, the shoot Lalu Prat, which is from Rav Yitzhak Nisim, one of the chief Sephardic rabbis of Israel, he's saying, For sure, the custom of not getting haircuts, for sure they did it at that time as well, when they uh, immediately started to practice this minhag after, according to the Geonim, after the Talmidim died. In the Geonim, when they wrote and they were just referring to, to marriage, weddings, that's because they were just answering according to how they were asked, what they were asked. So that's, Rav Nisim is saying that for sure, haircuts is just as strong as a minhag as not getting married. However, the question with this is that, you know, I brought plenty of sources that, uh, you know, for example, the tour as well, he brought some places had the minhag not to get a haircut. They weren't talking about, they weren't getting asked a question. They were just codifying this minhag in their works. Right, even uh, I bring in uh, the the Meiri as well in Yevamot. He writes Dechen Naagu Mitocha. He brings on the Gemara in Yevamot because of what happened. Mitocha Sheloli Saisha Mi Pesach Ad Atzeret or Ad Oto Zman. Right, and they don't mention anything about haircuts and the 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 Rigiat as well. He didn't mention anything about haircuts, even though he wasn't asked. He was just codifying the works of the Geonim. So it's kind of hard to accept what Rav Nisim is saying. So the first person, so we got do some, I was doing some research. Who was the first Rishon to mention the custom of not getting haircuts? So in the 13th century, we find the Shibule Aleket, who is from Italy. And he writes down, he says, So he writes, the Minang for not getting haircuts, he brings down, some places, yesh mekomot, not like everybody said that, the cholom mekomot everywhere. You know, some places have the custom not to take a haircut from Pesach until Lamid Gimel Be'omer. And the reason why we have to get into the whole Lamid Gimel Be'omer thing is where did this come from? Uh, nevertheless, before that, but you see from him that Lamid Gimel Be'omer for haircuts, the whole thing he brings out, I didn't read the whole thing, but it's very interesting. But for the marriage, he brings until Atzeret, until Shavuot. So it's kind of like, you know, Hatsi, he has this. For Lamegimel, for haircuts, you can get a haircut on Lamegimel or Lamedalit, whatever it is. But marriage, no, we're Machmer the whole time. Fine. And then he brings another one that some get married in Rosh Chodesh, and then he gives a different reason for it. But we're not going to get into these things. But now, where did this Lamegimel be Omer come from? So the Meiri brings down in the Gemara, on the Gemara, he says, So he says, there is a tradition from the Geonim that on the 33rd of the Omer, that's when the Talmudim stopped dying. And due to that, we have a custom not to fast on that day in Lamed Gimel Be Omer. And also, we don't get married until Lamed Gimel Be Omer. So he's saying the marriage thing, not like what the, the Shibulet Leket said, but we stop it also on the 33rd as well. Again, the Miri didn't mention about haircuts, but interesting too, you know, the Miri, he mentions Lag, Lagba Omer, but he just says, you know, you don't fast on it. It's not, he doesn't mention, you know, make a bonfire or don't say Tahanun. He's just saying, you know, we don't fast on that day because that's kind of a happy day because they stopped dying or kind of, I guess, I don't know about happy day, but it's just, I guess, <laughs> not as as sad as the other days. Fine. So it's very interesting. There's a Kabbalah from the Geonim that that it stopped, they stopped dying on the 33rd of the Omer because the Gemara says straight up from Pesah Ad Atzeret, right? Atzeret is, you know, until Shavuot. So where, where is this Kabbalah coming from? Did they have a different Girsa in the Gemara? Because you can't just make a Kabbalah that goes against the Gemara, a clear Gemara, right? So the Sefer Amanhig, 
from Provence, he brings down in the name of Rabbi Zerahia Halevi, right? The Balameor, who from uh, Gerona, I'm not sure why they spell it Geronitsa, Geronatsa. He says, Shematzak Kadu Besefer Yashan Habami Sfarad. That so the Rav Zerachia Alevi is saying that we found in an old text of the Gemara that it says Shemetu mi Pesach veAd Perusa Atzeret. So there's a one word that we didn't have. <laughs> there's an you have to throw in a word there Perus Atzeret. It's not Ad Atzeret until Shavuot, but until Perus. What is Perus? Perus is Palga half, right? When you say uh, Perus in Aramaic or I think it's Aramaic means half. And then we know the concept, usually 30 days is an amount of time. And therefore, palga, half of 30 days would be 15. And therefore, 15 days before Atzeret, before Shavuot, is not Gimel Be Omer. So that's based off uh, this, the Baal Meor saying that I found a Girsai in a Nusach in Sfarad that it had the word Perus on it. That's where we get this whole Lame Gimel Be Omer thing. And that's, uh, therefore, it's not really a, a Minhag or like a Kabbalah from the Geonim, like the Meiri said, is actually written in the Shas itself, according to this Girsa. Um, however, the Orhot Hayim, he's, you know, he's, he, he hears people talking about, he's also Rishon, he hears people talking about, oh, you only have to do it to Lamed Gimel Be Omer, only Lamed Gimel Be Omer. And he says, Ta'in him, they're making a mistake, right? Because the Gemara says, Adat said it, for sure it's Adat said it. And that, that people talk about Lamed Gimel Be Omer, that's only because from Pesach until Ad said it, you only have 33 days besides excluding Shabbat and the eight days of Pesach and the three days of Rosh Chodesh. So you're saying Lamed Gimel 33 is because those are the only days really that you can implement the morning because everywhere else they're happier days, whatever. So he's saying it's a mistake. But uh, anyways, so we find we find that the Rav Zerahia Levi, the Bale Mehor, he brings down that there is some Nusach. He found a Nusach, a text of the Gemara that says Perus, and therefore would be the 33. The question is now also, I mean, first of all, it's hard to argue on text because back then they had so many more texts than we have nowadays. You know, so many Gemarot were burnt in Spain. Uh, tons and tons of wagons of Gemarot were burnt. So we're missing for sure. Besides the fact we're missing Mesechtot of Gemarot that we don't have nowadays. So you can't even make a real seal my Shas nowadays because we don't have all Shas. The Ramah brings down, he has different Mesechtot that we don't have. Not only that, you know, they have, of course, different Girsalot. And we find it all the time. You can't ask questions on the Rama many times because he had different Girsalot than us. So we can't argue with that. But what we could argue is that the fact is that the Geonim that we mentioned above, none of them make this, you know, this Perus. They don't have this Perus in their Girsalot, right? Even Rav Shirira Gaon, whether it's the Sephardic or the French version, both of them have all the way to Atzeret. It doesn't have the word half. And we saw Rav Haigaon also over in Yerucham. Nobody has this half thing in it. But okay. So the question is, was this minhag of not getting married, was it mikubal everywhere? Was it accepted everywhere? So if you see in uh, the, the Abu Darham, he writes, Nohagin biktsat mekomot. He writes in some places, right? So, and, and he was a Talmud of the tour. In the Talmud of the tour, he wrote, he wrote everywhere. And this rabbi, the Abu Darham, he's writing, no, in, in ktsat mekomot. So he's arguing with his rabbi in one point that the fact that it's not everywhere, it's ktsat mekomot. Um, right, and that's probably why many many of the Rishonim they didn't mention it. They didn't even mention the Rambam, the Rif, the Rosh, because it wasn't so spread out everywhere. And you have to say, perhaps, is that you know, Chachamim, when they speak something, they use this, you know, I, I wouldn't say hyperbolic, but they exaggerate certain things to show to give strength to the minhag, to show that this is an accepted minhag. You know, of course, in Yemen they weren't keeping this minhag. You know, did the, the, the tour know what they were doing in Yemen or what they were doing in other places? No. But again, they're strengthening it by saying that this is a, a very plausible, seemingly very good, good minhag. And, uh, and that's why it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's something that we should codify. And, and you, the, you have to say this as well, because remember we said that the Geonim write, the Lashon was uh, from that time and onwards, meaning from the time that the Talmudim Rabbi Kiva died, and onwards they were practicing this minhag. But, you know, if that was the case, you know, we should at least find it somewhere. You know, not getting married for that long should be something mentioned in Shah, should be mentioned somewhere. So we have to say, perhaps just, you know, a little more rational, is that they, it really wasn't that old of a minhag. But to give it tokif, to give it strength, you know, they said it like it's a very ancient minhag from that time and onwards.
But of course, usually the Rambam, the Rif, they didn't really, you know, care about that so much. And they didn't think that it's such a strong minag, and that's why they didn't codify it. Or he, the, the Rambam, I just was reading today, that Rav Eliyahu El Barjel, the Av Beidin of Yerushalayim, it should be well, uh, he writes also that from the fact that the Rambam didn't bring it in where he brings uh, the Halachot of the Omer, you know, that shows that he didn't hold this custom. He should have said it. So I found the Rav Yekutiel Greenwald from Columbus, Ohio, believe it or not. He was a big Tami Hacham, a big Posek that passed away in 1955. He writes that, you know, he also had this problem that we all have is that, again, why did the Shas not talk about it? How come the Rambam didn't talk about it? So he writes right away is that the Rishonim made it up. He writes the Rishonim made it up and they made it up because of Masai Atzlav, meaning the Crusades, because of what happened during the Crusades in Europe. During the Crusades in Europe around 1096, 1097, when that in, initiated, and of course, all the Jews, Jews were being persecuted like crazy, the Hachamim, they created this, the, of that time, they created this custom. And it was because it was during the time anyways. And they were toled. They said, okay, you know, we're going to attach it to what happened to the children of Rabbi Akiva, to the Tamidim of Rabbi Akiva. And, and they didn't want to, and he brings down, they didn't want to, uh, they didn't want to, you know, hurt or offend which is interesting, or at least make known what happened to the goyim around them. So therefore they just said, you know, it was from uh, Rabbi Akiva time. That's why we're mourning and not because of you goyim, you guys are okay, whatever. Um, the problem with this is that, you know, if you read more, he writes that, you know, all the Rishonim don't mention it, but it's, uh, it's unfortunately it's wrong because we already saw above that way before the Crusades, uh, not way before, but at least a hundred years before the Crusades, where we already find Rabbeinu Yeruham quoting the Geonim that had this minhag. So that shot can't be said. However, uh, I also found though, there is a, a 13th century scholar in the, the Sefer Asufot. He brings down also, is that interesting? He brings this minhag. Minhag hu bazea malchut she'en no sim nashim ben pesach ratzer vivnet tsara gezerot she nehargu a kihilot bechol zea malchut. Right? So he brings down, we ta'anin alehem, we, we, he brings down, that the reason why we don't get married has nothing to do with what the Geonim said of Rabbi Akiva, rather because of the Crusades of that time, during those times. So you see that there is a basis for what Rav Greenwald was saying. However, again, we already have the Minhag brought from the Geonim earlier. So I want to say is that the reason why the Minhagim spread so, so um, out all over Am Yisrael was you had this small custom amongst the Geonim. It wasn't accepted everywhere. The Rambam didn't mention it. Others didn't mention it. But during the Crusades, when things started going really sour for Am Yisrael, especially in Europe, that's when this Minhag really took on full power and spread like wildfire all over Am Yisrael. And much stronger that it became a universal Minhag that pretty much everybody, that so much so that the Haram, sorry, the, the Shuchan Aruch, he codifies the words of the Tur, that even the Sephardi, Sfaradim were following this minhag. Fine. So that's just a simple shot that I was thinking, but uh, I would like to hear your thoughts. What do you guys think? So the thing is now, now shaving the sorry haircuts. We said it wasn't it wasn't brought down from the geonim. Seemingly, what I was saying as well is that you know perhaps because of the mourning that was going on because of the crusades, that minhag as well came and developed of not getting haircuts. And it wasn't like Rabbi Nisim, Rabbi Nisim said that it was some from the Gonim as well. No, these are things that were added on due to the terrible uh, catastrophes that went on during the time of the, the, the Rishonim. So interesting thing, the, the last, uh, or maybe last two topics to talk about is shaving. What about shaving or trimming your beard? So, so many Rabbanim, for example, Rabbi Badi Yosef, uh, the Chida, the 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 shoot mikvah hamayim Rav Moshe Malka from Morocco they bring down that the custom of haircuts was only mamash for your the he, the the hair on your head but not for your beard and the premise behind this the reason behind this is because they held that during the time of you know 500, 600 years ago a thousand years ago time of Chazal nobody was shaving their beard. Nobody was trimming their beard. People just, you know, there were everybody was Chabadnikim and they left their beards long, Hasidim, and they didn't touch their beards. Um, however, the Orlitzion says, no, 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 that's that's incorrect. We already see Chachamim, they talk about the halachot of Avelut. And uh, in the halachot of Avelut, it talks about, you know, you can't, you can't shave the, 
the hair of your beard. Um, and I actually, um, before that, we see from the, the, the Chida as well, the Chida brings down, let me see if I can find it where I wrote, the Chida brings down that, you know, he says in, in Mahzik Berakha, uh, he's saying the people in the in the east, the Sfaradim, you know, we they we grow our beards long, and we don't touch our beards like Hashem. That's what Hashem wants. However, you know, in uh, but the people in the Christian lands in Europe, there that they shave their beard, and therefore it would be nivul for them if they don't die. It's different. He, he's talking about halachot of avelud there, but this premise that the Chida goes with is that, of course, you know, Hamim. That's a recent development, and the Ashkenazim that they started doing it, he writes down at the last line, he says, Only 300 years before the Chida's time, that's when they started trimming their beards because of, uh, you know, whatever. He says, because of their great sins, they started shaving their beards and trimming their beards and touching their beards. However, the question on all these rabbis is that we find, uh, this is a beautiful proof that I found, the Yushalmi in Rosh Hashanah, it talks about how you can't compare, you know, I like showing this to, to people that don't touch your beards because they think it's like a thing from Hazal, but uh, if you see this Yushalmi, it's not so clear. The Yushalmi says, look how different the Jewish people are to the Goyim. The Goyim, before they have Yom Adin, you know, they they wear black and they don't touch them. They don't touch their beards. They don't touch their hair. They, they, they're they mourning because they're so scared to go to the court, to go for Yom Adin, for their court, before they go for a judge. However, the Jewish people, who is like us, who before, you know, Yom Adin, Rosh Hashanah, we actually wear white. We're wearing nice, beautiful clothing. And look at the Lashon, it says, uh, he says, Lovshim levenim, umitatefin levenim, umigalechin zekenam. And they shave their beards. So you see from the Yushalmi, the Yushalmi, these are Amorayim or Tanaim, probably this is Amorayim, I think. I didn't quote who said it. But you see already in the Yushalmi, they're writing that they were shaving their beards. Okay, Megalichim, you could also use the Lashon for trimming or cutting. It doesn't have to be shaving. But they were touching their beards, unlike, uh, you know, what the, the Chida was saying. So you see that for sure, you know, if there was a custom of not to touch their hair, that could be a custom as well during uh, the time of the, where they make this custom of the Omer. Sorry, I meant to say, is that if there was a custom not to touch your hair on your head, it could apply as well. Seemingly, it should apply as well to not touching your beard because that is something that Hahamim ha always equate together. Don't touch your hair. That means also you can't touch your beard, which is a machlogat again for Cholam Oed. If you're going to shave on Cholam Oed, you know, the, the same post scheme of Moshe Malka, all of them, they want to say that Hahamim never were gozer touching your beard during Cholam Oed. It was only about haircut. So therefore, they held that you could shave during Cholam Oed because Hahami never talked about that because they didn't shave their beards back then. But you see, it's not like that, right? And there's also another Tosef that talks about, you know, Hahami we're talking about, you're not allowed to cut your beard. So it's throughout Shas or in different places, not Shas, but in Chazal, that they were touching their beard. So anyway, back to the, the acceptance of this Minhag. The Radbaz, you have the famous Radbaz, who's living in Egypt. He comes down and he writes, they ask him about this minhag. And he says, he himself, Anna avidna uvda benafshai, I myself, kol chodesh nisan. The entire Nisan, I shave, I cut my hair. Virosh chodesh iyar, and on rosh chodesh iyar. So really, the, the Radbaz was probably one of the greatest Faridi Rabbanim during the time of Maran as well. And uh, he writes that he would do it the entire ER because that's a happy, uh, sorry, Rosh Chodesh uh, Nisan, because that's a happy month, of course. And also on Rosh Chodesh, because you can't do Avelud there. And he says, And he says also, if you don't shave, you know, if you don't cut your hair, that's going to be uncomfortable. There's going to be a lot of suffering for a person that usually cuts his hair, right? When I read this, I thought for sure he's talking about your beard. Right, because what Sard, you know, for 30 days, 20 days, according to the maybe 18 days, according to him, the calculations, if you include all Nisan and Rosh Chodesh, ER, you know, 18 days not cut, not going without cutting your hair for 18 days is not so bad. So the Sard probably would be, you know, your beard if somebody, because that's really, if you don't shave, it gets very uncomfortable. Uh, it affects the way you're eating as well, all that stuff. So therefore, that's what I thought. But I saw, you know, the Chida brings down from the Radbaz, he's talking about, you no, know, specifically haircuts, and they used to cut their hair all the time back then. 
which is interesting. I'm not sure the, the Chida lived 200 years after the Radbaz. So, we, you know, it could be that's the Mitziut, how it was, maybe it wasn't. I'm not sure. Um, fine. So anyways, you see that the, the Radbaz says that, you know, he himself would do it the entire Nisan and Chodesh and the Rosh Chodesh. And he says, um, he brings down also, and also, I, he says that I see many kilot that they actually take haircuts out of Shabbat, lichvot Shabbat. So therefore, you see the Radbaz didn't really hold so much of this minhag, how, that it wasn't really so strong, and it wasn't pochette, it wasn't spread out like all the other rabbis were saying it was. Right? And... Uh, I, I didn't quote it here, but Maran Beit Yosef, the Shulchan Aru, he codifies that, you know, he codifies and he 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 he, he makes it equivalent, the minhag of not to get a haircut and with not getting married. He gives it just as much credence. And therefore, you know, the Radbaz is saying, no, it's not, it's not so strong. Um, so something interesting I found about Moshe Levi in Tifilal Moshe, he brings down is that perhaps, you know, Maran that he wrote that, it's a mistake, you know, this year, probably the, the most popular question, I remember <laughs> COVID once it was, you know, can you do a Zoom on Zoom? Or can you, the Zoom thing before Pesach to let people hear your said there. This year, the biggest question, I think thousands of rabbis were getting text messages. Oh, Rosh Chodesh, am I allowed to shave on Rosh Chodesh? Am I allowed to shave on Rosh Chodesh? So Maran said that it's a ta'ut. If you shave on Rosh Chodesh or get a haircut on Rosh Chodesh, it's ta'ut, it's a mistake. You're to'eh. You're to he says, but for, for sure, the minhag is including Rosh Hodesh all the way until Lag Ba'omer or Lamed Lad Ba'omer. But uh, Rav Moshe Levi says something very nice. He says, perhaps if Maran Beit Yosef, you know, he saw what the Radbaz says, that many places didn't have the minhag of uh, refraining from haircuts, perhaps, you know, he would have withdrawn what he said. Perhaps he made a mistake because the Mitzut, the Radbaz is testifying that that wasn't the case everywhere. Um... Just to finish off on this on this uh, theme is that the biggest question that we all have to ask ourselves on the minhag of not getting a haircut is that we have a gemara in Ta'anit, a gemara Ta'anit that says straight up that even during Shavuot Shechalbo, right? Hahamim, we know on the on the week of Tisha B'Av, they made certain gezerot that we're not allowed to do, certain uh, halachot we're not allowed to do. And one of them is you can't, you know, you can't... Uh, clean your clothing and another one is you can't you can't get a haircut however hahamim said that when when tisha be'av is going to fall out on a friday you are allowed to shave on thursday you're allowed to get a haircut on thursday why because of kavod shabbat so you see from here that hahamim even on a takana that they did on a gizera that they did or takana however you want to look at it a takana they did that they said on Shavuot Shechalbo, the day, the week of the worst, you know, where we're, we're, we're keeping full-fledged Avelut because, or almost full-fledged Avelut, because of the biggest catastrophe that ever happened to Am Yisrael, the, the Chorban Bet HaMikdash. Nevertheless, they suspended this Takana because of Kavod Shabbat. So if that's the case, then Kalva Homer, for a custom, a post Hamuda custom, let's say, or any custom that developed, just a minhag, it's not a takana, it doesn't come from the bedin agadol, then for sure that you should be able to shave Erev Shabbat or get a haircut Erev Shabbat, Mishum Kavot Shabbat, it's a kalva homer. If hahamim said it's okay on a gezerah, a takana that they did, kalva homer on a minhag that you should be able to trim or get a haircut for Erev Shabbat. So that's just uh, something to leave off on. If we have just a couple, five more, three, four more minutes, if you don't mind, just regarding music, music is the latest development on, on this custom that wasn't found, you know, it's not found anywhere in Shas as well, and even in the Geonim, and even in the Rishonim. The first one to bring down the co concept of not uh, hearing music, it's not really even talking about music, rather he's talking about Rikudim and uh, Mohalot, he's talking about, it's the Magen Avraham, talking about you shouldn't uh, do dancing or make these, or, or, or these circle dances that, you know, they do at weddings, you shouldn't do that during the Omer. So that's what the Magen Avraham says. And from that, the poskim, they bring down that, uh, for example, the Minhat Yitzhak, I think I brought it here. Yeah, the Minhat Yitzhak, he brings down from there that, that Kalva Chomer 
you shouldn't listen to music then, right? If if the Magen of Ham saying we shouldn't do this dancing, Kalvachomer, we shouldn't listen to music as well because that's just as bad, which is hard to understand. And I saw Rav Eliyashev also says that it doesn't make sense because, you know, it, it, it's not a kol shikin, it's not Kalvachomer because dancing is much more happy than just listening to music. But whatever, the Minai became not to do like that. And the simple reason why, Hahamim, and nobody ever talked about it, even the Shulchan Aruch doesn't mention it, is because according to Harambam, according to the Shulchan Aruch, it's forbidden to listen to music throughout the entire year. Hahamim made a takana after Tisha B'Av uh, that you cannot listen to music. And that's why they don't even talk about listening to music. However, we have a kula nowadays, the the Shvut Yaakov, the Chelkad Yaakov, he brings down that Hahamim, they only made the sword for actual real instruments. But when you're listening on the radio or stuff like that, that wouldn't be a problem. Um, Nevertheless, just to end off, I found very interesting that the, the Orlit Sion, Rav Ben Surah Bashul, he brings down is that the Sfaradim, they never had this, this minhag of the, of the Magen Avraham. And therefore, in the Karadin, there's not even this concept of, of Isur for Sfaradim to listen, to, uh, to dance, and of course, even to listen to music, because that's just the outcome of the words of the Magen Avraham. And even I found from Rav Shlomo Zama Arba for Ashkenazi that the Magen Avraham and the Minhad Yitzhak, what they're talking about, that's only talking about music that's going to make you dance but if you're just listening to you know nice as they say chill music relaxing music in the background you know that and you, therefore you're not going to start doing some you know yemenite dancing from it therefore that wouldn't be a problem thank you so much guys for listening i appreciate it thank you so much Raham. if anyone has any questions comments they can uh, write in the chat box or uh, raise their hand on mute and we have a question from rob in the chat uh, rob you want to ask it or you want me to ask it uh, yeah, I'm happy to ask you. Yeah, I mean, it's only a minor thing, but you could say that with Shabbat, in the week of Shua Shachol Bo, the Shabbat is on the 10th of Av, right? Because Tisha Av is on the Friday. So they're allowing mm -hmm. you to shave for a period that's outside the period of mourning. So it's you could say that with, uh, you know, it's it's different saying that shaving on Shabbat during the, the, the first 33 days of the Omer, because the, the day after Shabbat is not going to be a, you're still going to be in a period of mourning. Sorry, so you're saying, wait, when they, it's Shabbat is really going to be on, they're pushing it off to a different day? Oh, no, you're saying, oh, it's the next week, you're saying. No way. Yeah, I, maybe I've misunderstood you, but like, let's say the Friday is the 9th of Av, right? Yeah. So, and they're saying you can shave on the Thursday for the Shabbat that's the 10th of Av, which technically, um, you know, I, I know we don't shave until after the, the start of the day, but on the 10th of Av, but technically the 10th of Av is no longer the period of morning. So they're allowing you to shave uh, for the Shabbat. You could say it's, the case it's different there because that's for the, that Shabbat will be after the period of mourning, whereas during like uh, the first 33 days, the Shabbat is still part of the period of mourning. No, the thing is that the, it's shaving on on Thursday for Friday. Right, Tisha B'Av is falling out on Friday, so they allow you to shave on Thursday for Shabbat, which is com coming after Tisha B'Av. So it's still yeah. the Shabbat. The Tisha B'Av is Shavu Shechal, but it still is for that week. But you're saying that, but it's shaving for after Shabbat, for after Tisha B'Av. But it, you're, I hear what oh, you're saying. It's shaving for Tisha B'Av, but it's after Shabbat. No, no, sorry. It's you're shaving for Shabbat, but it's it falls after Tisha B'Av. So it's I'm just saying I don't know if you can make a title card. Uh, because, it's oh, I hear, I hear what you're saying. I yeah, yeah. I'm not. Sure. I don't know if I agree with it, but I have to think about that. Yeah, I don't. I hear, I hear what you're saying, but uh, Hazak, thank you. Uh, I'm, yeah, I'm just, I'm not saying I'm right. I'm just saying. <laughs> right, right, I hear a good point. Yeah, yeah. Very nice. Anyone else? Uh, Eric. So <clears throat> I just wanted to know how this would fall. I, you once gave a detailed shirot about um, minhagim, like minhagamakom, minhagavot. So exactly. I'm curious where this would fall because I feel like it's sometimes minhag makom. Now it's like an inherent almost minhag Israel. I don't know how to, yeah, like, how to think about it, and I, I'm just curious your thoughts. How would you reconcile that with your 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 bigger, broader right? Exactly. And and just a curious question: um, Are there people who still, obviously in Teman, I think they had like you said they had a very different minhagim, but twofold with like. With marriage, are there still people who would say, and maybe I'm thinking a little bit about your, your previous show on, on, on Minhagim, but because it's like such an important thing and perhaps there's a, you know, you want to rush it for whatever reason, 
uh, is it better to err on the side of uh, Simcha and 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 Nisuata to get married? Um, if you you know you might miss that chance. Um, and also like just quoting the when you when you quoted the Urchot Chaim, I'm just curious if he would be okay with shaving or getting married. Let's say on on those obviously a Shabbat you can't get married, but like on those days. Um, you know, that he counts to 33 minus eight, whatever, you know, the, oh, he gets the 33. I'm just curious if he would like, for instance, um, shave on, on, on Rosh Hodesh or get married on, 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 on Rosh Hodesh. Um, I'm not sure if you're allowed to, I'm, I'm very ignorant when it comes to that, but like yeah. technically a shita, like following that shita or himself, would he be okay with that? Yeah. Good question. Um, so going back to the first one. So what I see is that really there's not really any universal minhag regarding these things. And I guess it depends on, I guess, what community you're part of. Um, but uh, I see most people, wherever you are, people are shaving weekly. Um, haircuts, maybe not, I'm not sure. But even though I know, I know even <laughs> one of my big rabbinim that they're, they're getting haircuts even, especially if they have some occasion, they're doing it. So it's very hard to say, you know, this universal minhag, because I don't even think we have that nowadays. Depends if you're living in maybe in a very Haredi circle somewhere in Yushalayim, maybe they have, or you're part of a yeshiva, learning in the yeshiva. But in the Balabatish world, you know, when you're working as a Balabait, I don't really know what uh, what mean hagim, what universal mean hagim there are. So it's very hard to to kind of say there's some uni, uni, universal mean hagim in these things. Um, uh, even regarding, uh, you know, listening to music, I also see she told left and right, you know, you know listen, you have to say Rav Shlomo Zamarabach saying music is okay. As long as it's not dance music and uh, Orlitzion, <laughs> he's saying them Sfaradim never had the minhag. But then you see Rabbi Rabbi Vadi Yosef saying, no, it is a Sfaradim minhag. Of uh, you know, he he goes with the minhat itzak, saying that yes, we learn it from the Magen Avraham. So it, uh, again, it's it, it, there's so many different she thought, so it's very hard. And regarding marriage, there's also there's a uh, really Rabbi Vadi is I didn't quote it here, but the Radbaz says that for marriage, okay, that's a minhag from the Geonim, it's an old minhag. But however, you know, for sure that wouldn't push off for Piriyariviya. If a couple never did Piriyariviya, of course they should get married. Um, and any other type of, he brings other, I forgot the other uh, situation he brings, but if he does. But, uh, and that's what Hamobadi, I saw his post like that. The post can bring down that for, you know, in, in times of need, if you, for especially for a Bachur that never did Piriyariviya, you can get married during that time. <laughs> so then that kind of, you know, the whole Minhag kind of goes down the drain pretty much, uh, mm -hmm. just because it's very confined to certain uh certain uh people in certain times um but yeah again there there there's no real universal minhag on these things so it's very hard to say i'm not sure i haven't done a, i haven't done a study on the different uh minhagim that uh different communities do for these things i know in like the, the Sfaradis communities i see almost every working guy does shave throughout the omer only a few you know like more yeshivish guys they don't do it so I don't even know. I'm not sure. It, yeah. Well, I know like in Montreal, like you would never be able to get, I'm sorry, that's where originally I'm from, but like uh, you would never be able to get married there during, I, I don't even know if you'd be really. able to get married during the whole omen. Like, really? Yeah. It just, and and so that's a problem. That's why I was asking if it becomes a minhaga makom, because now like in Montreal, yeah. you're out of luck. You're not going to be able to find anyone who's going to really? marry you. Yeah. Uh, so, so that's. Yeah. That, that's yeah. interesting. Montreal is a very interesting place because you yeah. do have, like a Mor you have Moroccan, a real like group of Moroccans by themselves. Um, however, they kind of lost the a lot yeah. of mystery of what they did in Morocco, <laughs> especially yeah. they have a lot of less love and Chabad influence there and yeah. different things. So it's very hard to see what's Minagam Akom also. So uh, yeah. I also think that, like just naturally, it's these are like happy. I don't know, like it just feels like the original intent of the Sefira. Maybe what we can take away from it today is is like you count towards the um, you know, the, the, the happiness, like you're, you're, you know, this, I, I'm pretty sure before this, these were probably amazing. Huh? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's a simple shot for the, for yeah. the Torah. everything there. You're, you're counting towards Shavuot, a beautiful day. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, good question. Hazak. Sorry if I didn't answer your question so well, but yeah. You gave, you gave me an idea. You gave me an idea about the Minhag, if it's a Minhag or it's, yeah, it's not. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Thank you. Nice to meet you. <laughs> So according to the original um, seemingly codification of the minhag, which is to not get married, and then uh, on that, on the, the Magen Avraham says, yeah, but if when you don't get married, don't do it with dancing and things like that. And then we take it from there, or like it's taken from there to happy music in the car. Can we just say that it was like, 
when you get married, don't play music because you have a wedding going on. Like they were never intending to get rid of music on its own as a happy thing. They were saying when you have super, super happiness, don't make it su extra happy with live music and dancing. So it's always going to be, it's always connected to the wedding. Yeah, absolutely. They're, I think they're talking about like Nisuin or Shiduchim, whatever, when they do that uh, engagement, which is allowed during the Omer, not the wedding. And you're right, he's saying just don't do it so happy like that. And it's true. It looks, and nowadays, music has become such a essential part of our lives very differently than the way Chachamim or the Rishonim or even the Achronim, the Magen Avraham ever imagined or fathomed because, you know, nowadays everybody has their little buds in their ears and they're listening to music all the time or in their car and radio. So it's uh, definitely not that same feeling that music gives off as it did when you're dancing. And besides the fact that the simple shot is that when you're dancing, I, I, I correct me if I'm wrong, but when you're dancing with friends and doing these, you know, you know, the circles together, that's for sure much greater than just, you know, listening to music, even rock music or whatever it is, you know, you're not going to be that same simcha is not there, especially because the fact we're so used to music and it doesn't uh, do that same, uh, have that same effect on us. So for sure. Yeah. It's uh the, the music thing, again, where it's it's an, another custom that was seemingly invented from thin air. That's what the Rav Eliyashev actually says. He, he argued with the Minhad Yitzhak and saying you can't compare it to what the Magen Avram was saying. But nevertheless, that became the custom. But you see, the Orlitzion says it's not the custom <laughs> for Svaradim. So that was uh, nice to see that as well. You know, the, the, the biggest sort of David Shilush, I didn't bring it, but he ends off, he's like, he ends off in his teshuvah. He's saying, people, they, they get so worked up about these minhagim and, you know, they're not following halacha and so many things. And in these minhagim, they're so machmir and they're judging other people by the way, you know, their beard are in this and that. And that. He says, this is the tafel of the tafel of the tafel. And the focus more on, you know, he, he says to focus on, you know, what happened to Rabbi Akiva and have that, that in mind and the spirit and not, you know, focus on the tafel things, which is the biggest one as well. Which one of the sources I, for, I missed say that you're allowed to get married after 33, after Lag? Um, I think it was the, the Meiri brings it down. Um, yeah, Ad Otozman, yeah, the Meiri brings it down. Mm -hmm. And what's this idea of people choose picking and choosing, like I do first half, I do second half? Like what, yeah, what is that entire idea? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I, I didn't really look into that, but I know it's the, the Ashkenazim do that, not Sephardim, but no. Ashkenazim do it. Right. Yeah. Because, and, uh, yeah. No, no, go. No, no, it's okay. It's, uh, and then and, and for those that are comparing and contrasting between Halachot of Trua Velut, I mean, can, can we really compare? Uh, we're not, we don't actually draw all over all, copy paste all, all of the Halachot of Velut. Um, so can we really compare about how we do halachot and avalut and draw it over? Right, you're saying like the olitzion did for shaving the beard and everything. Right, yeah. exactly. Yeah, again, it's a custom, and therefore, you know, you would think only in that thing. But the 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 debate that the poskim are having about shaving is, did they shave back then or not? You know, and therefore, was it a common thing or not? So I was just trying to say is that you know, listen, throughout Chazal, you see they were trimming their beards and they were, you know, touching up themselves on their face. So therefore, you know, if there was a minhag not to get a haircut, it'd be probably mistama. It was the same thing. And uh, yeah, so. So, yeah, even the, the Radbaz, it's interesting, the Radbaz, where the Chida said that the Radbaz, I didn't, I don't know if I quoted that the Radbaz, he, they were living in, uh, they were during a time, uh, they were, sorry, they weren't talking about shaving the beard because that was only a minhag in Eretz Edom and from 300 years ago. The funny thing is, is that the Radbaz came from Christian Spain. <laughs> and in Christian Spain, for sure, they were shaving their beards. So if they were shaving their beards, then Mislam, maybe I'm sure the Sfaradim there as well were probably, you know, doing some touching of their beard as well, because that was the Minhag in Spain of the Goyim. And usually that's what happens. We dress the way, we look the way the Goyim are around us. So just something interesting too. I think I wrote it in my in my paper that I wrote, but I didn't bring it here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and if I must, if I recall, the Shulchan Aruch writes um, the Istaper, but he doesn't say the Itkadar. Right, he just says Istaper. But the thing is, is that uh, you know, the Istaper is haircut is that anywhere, and the the, the Orlitzion says it's anywhere. Even you want to shave your legs or you know anywhere armpits, it's part of it. That's right. uh, the same thing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Fascinating. Anyone else? Fascinating. Mm-hmm. 
Okay. So with that, uh, we'll close the night. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for coming on. Thank you so much, Chacham, as always. Very informative and insightful. It's incredible thank to you. have with us. Uh, Lailatov, everyone. Thank, thank you. Again. Thank you.